August 2018, news reports begin to flood in regarding a missing wife and her two young daughters. Colorado resident, 34-year-old Shannon Watts and her two daughters, Bell 4 and Celeste 3, seemingly vanished on August 13. 33-year-old husband, Christopher Watts makes a plea for their safe return. Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. Like, if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with, without anybody here. An emotional talk of ending their marriage is what he claims caused the disappearance. Uh, we had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. But it would be no more than two days later that Christopher Watts would be arrested for the murders of his family. Shannon and Chris met in North Carolina in 2010. Shannon's first marriage had ended. Bad relationship before. I was married, um, went through a really awful uh, divorce, and that relationship really. Um, she had took been a diagnosed with lupus. Long story short, uh, I was diagnosed with health challenges about in 2010. Well, what is lupus? Lupus is a type of arthritis where the body starts attacking itself. It's called an autoimmune disease. The cells of the immune system start attacking the kidneys, the skin, and the joints. And people with lupus end up with inflammation in their joints and swelling and arthritis. They also can end up with kidney disease. But most patients with lupus have skin rashes. That is, they can have a butterfly rash over their cheeks. On their third date she was feeling unwell and realized Chris was the one when he let her lay on his lap for hours and cared for her. He proposed to Shannon a year later and they married in November 2012 at the Doubletree Hilton in North Carolina. The following year, Bella was born. Two years later Celeste was born. Shannon was able to have two healthy pregnancies despite her lupus diagnosis. Chris and Shannon purchased a house in Frederick, Colorado in 2013. They stayed with friends whilst building was completed. It was a long way from their families back in North Carolina. There was resentment towards Shannon from Chris Watts mother, who disliked Shannon. For the Watts family, life was good. Chris found work in the oil fields, after forging a career in mechanics he began to suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome. The change of career resolved this. Shannon had several jobs until settling upon a career in direct sales. What if you tried Thrive and it made you feel amazing? The work was and ideal as she could work from home and okay. parent. Um, Cookies and cream. Daddy's going to try it too. Yeah. Are you both? Yes. So everyone's going to try Chris Crumb. Despite both their incomes, they faced bankruptcy court but were able to manage to keep their home despite monthly mortgage payments in excess of $2,500. The Watts wanted to maintain an extravagant home and lifestyle but their income was struggling to support this. Watts had extensive medical bills due to Celeste being born with a narrow esophagus and tree nut allergies. Bella had respiratory issues. Shannon had neck surgery to repair a damaged disc. Friends describe the family as happy and content. That Shannon and Chris clearly loved each other, they both adored their children and Chris was a very involved parent as was Shannon. No one could recall a time when they had fought and there was no record of any violence or abuse within the family unit. In fact no one was able to recall a time when Chris lost his cool. Friends and co-workers describe him as quiet, extremely helpful, and very reserved but had no bad words to say of him. 
was in a pretty rough place and he sent me a friend suggestion a friend request and I said what the heck let's we're never gonna meet it's just Facebook right the thing about Facebook is you eventually hardly meet the person um, which is great and we met and we fell in love and long story short we're here I couldn't be I couldn't have asked God for a better man in my life because he's so supportive he takes care of me he's um, he's becoming funnier in his day old age I tell him um, he's sexy he's good-looking um, and he does take care of our girls like he's probably the best father I could have asked for for my children the same for Shannon she had a wide circle of friends who never had any qualms with her so excited guys it's about to start can't wait to you guys see what's going on around us They described Shannon as caring, supportive and a little OCD as Shannon was very meticulous and organized with all aspects of her life. The health supplements she endorsed, she claimed aided her recovery from the effects of lupus and Chris began to lose significant weight and increase his physical health with help from the supplements. A happy marriage, a beautiful family and a lavish home, the Watts had it all. Oh, don't look at Daddy. He's opening his birthday present. I, I, I want my own. He's getting a month of thrive. That's it. Are thrilled with your birthday present? Oh, 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 oh,
build something similar to what you have done with your wife and those cute girls. I do believe in karma so out of respect for myself, you and your family I think it is best we keep that friendship at work. Nikki. Yes a beautiful life is something that is hard to find in this world since people always seem to have an agenda for everything. I do believe in karma so I agree with that as well. Any conversations we have will stay between us, no need to worry there. My work number is, if you need to get a hold of me in the field. Sometimes email can be tricky with my spotty service out here. I have an early morning meeting and I'm doing loto for a construction crew on various sites all day so if I don't see you tomorrow, I hope you have an amazing day. They had their first date at a park near Nicole's home. As Shannon is celebrating a pregnancy completely naive to the fact her husband is lusting after another. I know, boy boy, Chris wants a boy, I hope it's a boy for him, it'll make him happy. Meanwhile, Shannon and her daughters are preparing to fly to North Carolina to see family and help expand her customer base. She intends to spend five weeks away, giving Chris perfect opportunity to develop his affair. I'll be in like Moore County um, area for about six weeks to build a business, and I'm super excited. So I uh, will see. I'm going to see who I can get out there. So. Just before Shannon left for Colorado, her and Chris attended a Thrive event in San Diego. They return to Colorado on June 26th. Shannon then packs and leaves with the girls to fly to North Carolina for five weeks, leaving Chris alone. According to Kessinger, their relationship is now sexual and they spend time at her home and going on dates. Kessinger insists that Watts informed her, his marriage was in the process of separation and they were only residing together whilst they finalized the divorce. Despite Shannon having a very large social media presence as it was essential for her business and she even managed Chris's social media accounts, Kessinger insists she was unaware Chris was lying about his status. The beginning of July, Chris has began sleeping in the basement and is spending more and more time with Kessinger. With Shannon and the children away in North Carolina, Watts and Kessinger spend more and more time together. July 4 Watts invited Kessinger to his home and cooked her lunch. Two days later they go on a date to the cinema, followed by a trip to Boulder Car Museum. They even attend an event at Bandemir Speedway. Their relationship is moving fast. His phone records show he installs an app to store the sorted photos Kessinger is sending him. His phone searches include when to say I love you, looking for mineral stones and frequent visits to top up a prepaid Visa card. Other searches included Victoria's Secrets, Spanish dancing, local restaurants, song lyrics, and love poems Watts would use to write cards and notes for Kessinger. Phone records show Watts and Kessinger messaged or talked almost daily throughout July, they also sent illicit photos to each other. Kessinger would later tell investigators that during this time Watts discussed getting an apartment and selling the family home. Two days before he is set to fly out to North Carolina to see his family, he and Kessinger have a romantic getaway. Shannon is beginning to notice he has little time to chat. I'm sorry boo. I fell asleep as soon as I got home. That he killed me yesterday. I love you so much. You okay? It's like you don't want to talk. I kept trying to talk and I had to dig it out of you. I'm fine baby. The last few days at work have put a lot of responsibility on me with new people. I didn't mean to seem short boo. I love you to the moon and back. You could have answered or texted back. 
thought something happened. But you don't care about others' feelings. Or think you're with another girl, or worse. No consideration of others. I try to give you space, but while you are working and living the bachelor life I'm carrying our third and fighting with our two kids daily and trying to work and make money. It's not hard texting love you and miss you. If you don't mean it then I get it, but we need to talk. I kept looking at my phone all night and no response from you. Like seriously. We didn't just start dating yesterday. We've been together 8 years and have 2.5 kids together. Sorry you're so tired, but I haven't talked to you in 48 hours and I had a hard weekend. Glad I have you to talk to. It would have been nice for my husband to show interest in how the girls and I are, and the baby. I'm done with begging for you to talk. See you Tuesday. I'm sorry you had a hard weekend boo. I will make it up to you I promise. I'm sorry I'm out of it tonight. July 9th, whilst Shannon. Bella and Celeste are in North Carolina visiting Watts' parents. Cindy Watts, Chris's mother, exposes Celeste to ice cream with nuts in them. Celeste has a severe tree nut allergy and despite Shannon warning them of this, she still exposed Celeste. Shannon contacts Chris who offers to call his dad and have a word. Shannon and Cindy have always had a rocky relationship. Shannon and I just couldn't get along, and um, I don't, I didn't like the way she she treated him. July 31st, Watts flies to North Carolina. He hasn't seen Shannon and the girls for five weeks and has been spending time with Kessinger. Whilst en route, he deletes Kessinger's contact details from his phone. The reunited family head to Myrtle Beach. This would be the first and last time Bella and Celeste experience the seaside. The following week tension is apparent between Shannon and Chris. Despite the time spent apart, Chris is shunning Shannon. The next seven days begin to lay the foundation for the tragedy that would follow. What is poignant is Kessinger would later tell detectives that prior to Watts leaving, she had encouraged him to try and work things out with his wife. Meanwhile Watts' phone records show that in between taking pictures of his children at Pavilion Park, he is adding nude selfies of Kessinger to his secret app and on August 4, Kessinger spends two hours online, searching for wedding dresses followed by web searches for Watts and Shannon's Facebook accounts. Throughout the week at Myrtle Beach, the argument between Shannon and Cindy Watts about the ice cream incident causes friction. Watts' parents refuse to attend Celeste's birthday party and Watts accuses Shannon of creating tension between him and his father, Ronnie. Shannon feels like Watts is taking sides with his family despite Cindy's actions endangering Celeste. You making me feel like complete shit these last several weeks especially this week and I'm not okay with it and I won't change my ways when it comes to our kids. And I always defended you. Always. The tension between Shannon and Chris peaks during their time together in North Carolina. Although Chris deleted messages, Shannon's remained, they have discussed their relationship and Chris is telling Shannon he is having doubts about how he feels. I don't know how you fell out of love with me in 5.5 weeks, or if this has been going on for a long time, but you don't plan another baby if you are not in love. Kids don't deserve a broken family. I left you, you couldn't take your hands off me. You show up and I have to practically ask for a kiss in airport. If you are done, don't love me, don't want to work this out not happy anymore and only staying because of kids, I need you to tell me. I just don't get it. You don't fall out of love in five weeks. How can you sleep? Our marriage is crumbling in front of us and you can sleep. Your only response last night was I don't want to lose the kids. You used me to just have a boy, 
only reason you wanted another kid. I can't handle this and you are okay with it. Why didn't you just tell me you were done? Why get me pregnant? I'm not just staying because of the kids. They are my light and that will not change. I didn't fall out of love in five weeks, that's impossible. I don't want to erase eight years just like that. I'm not sure what's in my head. I don't know if it's my parents, the third pregnancy, if I'm just scared or what. I didn't use you. This isn't the only thing. This doesn't get your head all screwed up something changed in the last five weeks. Something you won't say. 40 minutes before boarding their flight back to Colorado, Shannon sent Watts this message, the last line I really don't want to leave here. Shannon oblivious to the fact he is cheating on her is distraught and desperate to salvage their marriage. Shannon confides to her friend, he hasn't touched me all week, kissed me, talked to me except for when I'm trying to figure out what's wrong. Shannon's friend Addie asks if Watt's parents are the problem. Shannon says they apologized but didn't go to Celeste's birthday party. She just wants to cry, she tells Addie they never had a problem like this before. He hasn't asked how she is feeling despite a bout of vomiting. Addie tries to reassure Shannon that he's just nervous about the baby. Their conversation continues the next day. Shannon tells Addie she has spent nearly all week in tears. Shannon is now back home in Colorado. She has cancelled the gender reveal party and has asked her friend to just tell her the gender instead because Watts is telling Shannon he is not in love anymore, he has even rejected sex from Shannon. He is telling Shannon he wants to divorce, she tells Addie maybe she should consider fixing things with Cindy Watts. She thinks he slept in the basement. Shannon tells Addie that her and Watts had a talk and they agreed to go to Aspen for a weekend but is wondering why he deleted his Facebook account, when she asked him why, he ignored her. Shannon tells Addie she is having a boy. On August 4 Kessinger searched for Watts and Shannon's Facebook accounts, could this have been what prompted Watts to delete his Facebook account days later? On 9th of August at 11.44 am, Watts took this photo of the girl's doll and sent it to Shannon. Shannon posted it to her Facebook account with the assumption that one of her daughters had done it. This would later lead people to believe that Shannon had taken the image not Watts. All while Shannon is sharing pictures of her son's ultrasound and a letter she has written to Watts. She purchases a marriage self-help book for Watts and tells her friends that Watts wants to move to Brighton, Colorado and he has agreed to come with Shannon when she drops Bella off at school on Monday. August 10, despite their relationship troubles, Shannon leaves Colorado to attend a weekend business trip to Arizona. She leaves Bella and Celeste with Watts. As soon as Shannon has left he is arranging for a babysitter to come the next night. He concocts a story about having to go to a baseball game with work colleagues but, he intends to meet up with Kessinger. Shannon sends Watts the details of a realtor and he looks it up. Watts does some errands then meets up with co-worker Troy McCoy, to give him a fire stick. Whilst chatting to Troy, Watts overhears a phone conversation Troy has with work regarding a line that needs checking on one of the oil sites. This site would later become the deposition site for the bodies of his family. August 11, in preparation for their date, Kessinger's web searches include, How to Prepare for Anal Sex, Anal Sex Guide. She then watches interracial porn videos online. Meanwhile, Watts waits for babysitter, McKenna to arrive. He then heads out in Shannon's Lexus to meet Kessinger. They hook up then head out for a meal at a nearby Lazy Dog restaurant. Oddly, Watts who was always cautious to cover his tracks went out with Kessinger, usually used a prepaid card to pay for dinner but, on this night he chose to use his and Shannon's joint card. Yet he looked up the Rocky game scores before heading home. After their date, that evening Kessinger web searches Chris Watts, Shannon, 
Ronnie Watts and 2825 Saratoga Drive the Watts home address. Although, she would later tell detectives she had no clue exactly where Watts lived. Later that evening, Shannon searches for Lazy Dog menus then briefly calls Watts. It is later disclosed that Shannon had received an alert from the bank regarding the bill, she was able to determine that the meal cost $60, she then queries Watts as to why it is so costly. This began to raise Shannon's suspicions about Watts having an affair. August 12th Shannon messages Watts. She asks how the girls are doing and tells Watts to give them kisses from her. 9.04 am, Shannon sends her friend Addie a lengthy message, she is telling Addie she realizes her faults and wants to work on her marriage, despite the previous night's suspicions over the meal. I need to do better with my calendar, I don't block out family time, I fill in family time. He said to me last night it has nothing to do with business though think it's itty bitty things. I sometimes can be bitchy and he gets that side of me. I know I tend to make him feel like he isn't able to do things because I have control issues. He said the other night he wishes I'd just let him hang up a picture. I always have, but he also never calls me out. He never fights me, just goes with flow. He and I know I like things done a certain way but I never thought about how that may make him feel as a man. I don't even know if this is what's bothering him. He still hasn't said. I'm praying he wrote me a letter like I asked since he can express himself better in a letter than talking. I'm the pusher and he's the withdrawer. He has strengths that are my weaknesses and vice versa. The lack of communication isn't on my part. I can be better at how I communicate but he doesn't communicate. I say things sometimes just to get him to react in any way since he doesn't react and that's not good. It's not even all the time. 99% of the time we are perfectly fine. And we have never ever fought. Literally over anything serious. I have fought with him over stupid shit like not doing something I asked in a timely manner. My weakness is I have an Italian temper that can't hold back when pissed, I'm a fixer and I want to talk this out and he just wants to work it out in his head. Shannon then messages Watts asking him if he is able to get the girls' backpacks and blankies ready for the following day. Watts then gets the girls ready to go to a friend's birthday party. He takes several pictures of Bella and Celeste throughout the day and sends some to Shannon, who is preparing to fly home later that evening. Shannon's father FaceTimes with Bella and Celeste around 5 p.m., this is the last confirmed sighting of them alive. Watts then contacts his co-worker Cody Roberts and offers to go check oil site survey 319 the next day, the same site Troy McCoy discussed earlier. Watts then puts the girls to bed presumably and has a two-hour chat on the phone with Kessinger, who would later tell detectives she couldn't remember the details of their conversation but recalls hearing a TV in the background. Watts was sleeping in the basement most of the time but most likely slept in the bed because he was minding his children. During this time, Shannon is trying to call Watts to let him know her flight is delayed, he finally replies claiming to have fallen asleep on the couch. August 13, 1.25 a.m. and Shannon finally lands at Denver Airport. Friend Nicola, drops her off at home at around 1.45 a.m. The Watts security system alerts to Shannon's entry at 1.48 a.m. This is the last time anyone sees Shannon alive. Her movements following are unclear, According to the home security system no activity is detected on the main floor until 4.23 a.m. Although no cell activity is recorded on Shannon's mobile, according to detectives she attempted to make an online purchase of hair products at around 2.30 a.m. but her card was declined. The only trace of Shannon, is her shoes left by the front door, her suitcase and her purse left on the kitchen counter. Watts' neighbor's security camera captures Watts reversing his truck up to the garage door, 
he then appears back and forth loading stuff into the back of the truck. The position of the vehicle obscures his activity. This is where he placed the bodies of his family. He is seen loading a gas can into the truck. At 5.46 a.m., he drives 47 miles to the Survey 19 site where he attempts to conceal his crime. Watts travels to Survey site 319, he arrives around 6.30 a.m., he contacts fellow worker to say he is at site, he is trying to determine when anyone will arrive. He has little time to dispose of the bodies. He drags Shan Ann's body across the dirt and buries her in a shallow grave and puts both of his children in separate oil tanks. He then sends a text to Shan Ann's phone. If you take the kids somewhere, please let me know where they are at. Watts then goes about his usual work tasks, even stopping at a gas station to grab some food. Co-workers later tell police that his behavior was no different than normal, the only observation noted is that he is not wearing his new work boots and his clothing is unusually scruffy. Watts makes a call to Bella's school, he tells them the girls will no longer be attending but then asks if they turned up today. He then calls the realtor and discusses selling the house, however, Shannon had a doctor's appointment at 9 a.m., Watts failed to cancel this. Oddly, at 10 a.m. Watts searched for the lyrics to a Metallica track called Battery. Shan Ann's mother calls Watts asking if Shan Ann is okay. Watts held a short conversation then took photos of flowers. It would be Shan Ann's friend Nicole who raised the alarm, she arrived at Shan Ann's after not being able to contact her, fearing that Shan Ann had collapsed she attempted to enter the home via the lock code but was alarmed when a latch was left across the door. This latch was installed to prevent the children from running out the front door and could only be locked from the inside. Nicole contacted Watts, he tries to play down the issue, saying he and Shannon had argued and she had left with the girls. Nicole, however was astute and saw through the garage window that Shannon's car was still there. She sensed something was wrong and called the police. When the police officer arrives, Watts is making his way home. Nicole knows Shannon missed her doctor's appointment and knows Shannon is not the type of person to just vanish.
Scott, how you doing? How's it going? So this is the only vehicle she would have? Only one that, yeah. She would drive? Okay. If you don't mind. not there. I just want to make sure she's not passed out somewhere. Is she, is she diabetic? You mind if I look around? Okay, thanks. Shut down.
I never black out or have no. seizures or anything like no, that. No, it's me. able to pull up the video of the 12 cap and just see the, the his front yeah, door. That, that, that was you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Anything by the wedding ring? Is any of her clothes, anything like that, missing? this on continually yep. recording? Yep. Well, it's not, is it motion or is it, been, okay, so it's motion. Any motion events that happened, they got, but I get cars driving from this street, from this street, this is him at 
want to go talk to him, I'm going to get his info real quick. Yeah, but it, I mean, put yourself in his situation. Oh, I agree. You know, anyone's going to be nervous. They don't know what to do. Um, no, I agree, but I'm just saying the way he told you three times. 
It has been less than 24 hours since Watts murdered his family, he spends the night at home and agrees to speak to detectives the next day. He continues to deceive those around him. Shannon's mother, Sandy is pressuring the police to investigate him. She knows his truck has GPS and she was aware of the tension between them, investigators begin to speak to Shannon's friends. They soon find out that Shannon had been having serious concerns about her husband's behavior change and his fidelity. Watts spends the rest of the day responding to desperate messages and calls from Shannon's concerned family and friends. At 11 p.m. he spends 50 minutes talking to Kessinger on the phone. According to Kessinger they discuss the fact Shannon and the girls are missing. She seems to believe she has left for marital reasons and fails to realize how serious the issue is. They also FaceTimed, Kessinger pointed out seeing Watts on a mattress with no sheets, he also mentioned he had been cleaning and had washed the kids' bedding. Tuesday, August 14. It has been 24 hours since Shannon was last seen. Friends, Nick and Amanda Thayer, decide to visit Watts and offer him support. Watts is under mounting pressure from everyone, the police declare Shannon and the girls as missing, Watts undertakes an interview with a local news crew and the police send in a canine search team.
what? What they fail to disclose to Watts is that the dogs are trained to detect trauma not just scent. The dog alerts to all bedrooms and the basement. The canine team hear child's laughter but are unable to locate the source. Meanwhile, suspicion is beginning to mount towards Watts. Later that day he is interviewed by the FBI for over two hours. Watts agrees to come in the next day for a polygraph test and decides to stay with the Thayers that evening. His dad Ronnie is flying in from North Carolina the following day. Whilst the search for Shannon continued, Kessinger and Watts maintain contact. According to police interviews she was beginning to suspect Watts had something to do with Shannon's disappearance but as the news reports began to circulate, Kessinger claims this is how she found out Shannon was 15 weeks pregnant. Phone records show she searched for Shannon and began to Google topics such as kin cops trace texts, how long do phone companies keep text messages? she was careful to delete the searches afterwards. In fact she had deleted everything related to Watts at this point, Wednesday August 15. Detectives continue to gather information about Shannon's disappearance. They ask Watts to come in to undertake a polygraph test, Watts agrees but first collects his father, Ronnie, from the airport. It is now the third day since Shannon and the girls vanished. GPS logs lets detectives know that Watts' truck first visited Servi Oil Site 19 on Monday morning, they receive an email from Watts' employers before Watts arrives. The company has discovered email communications between Watts and Kessinger. This vital information casts even more suspicion towards Watts. With access to his phone records, they can establish a possible motive. Kessinger would later that day contact the detectives. Whilst Watts is preparing for a polygraph, police have already searched his home and found bed sheets in the trash, their next search site is Survey 19. Watts fails the polygraph test. Still he tries to rationalize this with claiming the deception detected is because he has been cheating on Shannon. So, um, it was completely clear that you were not honest during the testing and I think you already know that. We need to talk about that, okay? I cheated on her. I know. And this is very good. Keep I, 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 I'm not proud of it. I, I don't think anything like that could happen. I don't think I would ever do it, but I did. I know. Keep going. She accused me of it. I denied it. I, I, I cheated on her, and I feel horrible for it. Like she was pregnant, and it was. 
I don't want to. I didn't hurt her. I cheated on her. I hurt her emotionally. I cheated on her. And I feel absolutely horrible about this, but that's what I've been holding. I, I, when I, I didn't go to the Rocky again, I was with her. Okay. I went to dinner with her. Keep going. That five weeks I was alone, I was with her most, most of the time. Okay. You're doing a good job. This is the Chris that I knew would come out today. This is the Chris who tells the truth because you're a truth teller. When I tell you I fell out of love, it's because I fell out of better. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's God's honest truth. Okay. He continues to deny having any involvement with Shannon's disappearance. It's as though he has a pre-planned script and is sticking to it. Investigators have profiled Watts, they know he has no criminal convictions, friends and family have all come forward to say he is a good person. Even with the intensity of questioning, Watts doesn't react adversely. He doesn't protest to his innocence either. When investigators tell Watts they know about his affair, he does react, he wants to protect her from all this. This reaction is the key, it is the only time he has shown concern for anyone throughout the past few days. It also tells investigators this may have been his trigger. Who is her? So I, I don't want to get her involved in this. I don't want to ruin her life. Like it's something, something like this. I don't want her involved in this. Okay. So can we talk about that a little bit? Yes. I knew that you would say you didn't want to get her involved. But I, I, just I, I because you like she's, to take care of She's a wonderful person. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, she knew I was married. Yes. And I told her we're going through issues. Yes. Yes. And I told her that. You know, we we're going to get, you know, at the end, like, you're we going to get separated. Like, once I figured out what that was, I didn't know what that was going to be. I know. I had no idea. I, I like, you know, I saw her, took my breath away, and I never thought in a million years that could happen. I know. I don't even think of a figure. Not, um, like, but, like, it was, I never felt that way about anybody, like, anybody in my lifetime. Mm hmm Chris, that's not your fault. No, I'm, I'm, I, no, 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 I'm just, well, I'm, can we do this? Um, I know you want to take care of her because be, it's because you're a type of guy who takes care of women. It is. You took care of your wife, you took care of your daughters, you were very good at taking mm -hmm. care and you want to take care of her. So can we make a deal? I don't think this girl did anything to hurt anybody, okay. but I can't walk out of here wondering. So, can you leave her out of it? Okay. Get back to your wife and your daughters. Okay. Where are they? That I do not know. That was what I was holding back. Like I didn't know. Like Chris, what I Chris, did. I know, Chris. In the interview today, you weren't asked about infidelity. You were asked about. That was I was holding back from last night. That's when not you why you failed today. That's not how that works. You would have reactions to every single question, not just the ones that we talked about being important. Like the ones you wanted me to lie about, I, like, is that what you're talking about? No, the ones about her disappearance yeah. and knowing where she's at. And I just, I just find it hard to hear you talk about just having this emotional you know, conversation with Shanann and you're bawling and crying together. And you have not shed one tear in two days that you've been here. No, not once. one. And I help me understand that because I don't get it. You're these are your baby girls, no. and you have not shed one tear over them not being around. Chris, I I, 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 I lose my four year old in the store for ten seconds, and I start to go panic, panic. I have not seen any of that from you at all. Help me understand I, that. I love those girls. I, I would never do any of this because I haven't shed a tear. You get yeah, no, that's weird. I, Is I, that I, weird? I, I, don't, 
don't look into that like I don't love my well, kid. Tell me, my explain wife. to me. You're you're crying with your wife that you're leaving her. Yeah. But you don't cry that your two little baby girls. I'm hoping leaving. they're still around some I'm hoping they're still somewhere. Yeah, but you alive. don't have them right now. You're I not know. reading stories to them at night. I know. You're not giving them midnight snacks. You're not giving them their medicine. You're not waking up with them in the morning. I know this. Like I So that I, should cause you pain. It does cause me pain. But I don't see that. I, I don't see that. I want to see I, the Chris that cares. I want to see I, the Chris that, you know, feels bad about what he did and wants to, you know, get this off his chest and be done with this and let us find your little girls so that they're not out there in the middle of a field or whatever somewhere. Like, don't do that. I, I love those girls to death. Then show us that. Show us that. Show us this, Chris. That not this, Chris. I'm not. Sh I'm not showing you that. Cr I'm. I'm showing you the Chris that cares about his girls and his wife. Just because I haven't shed a tear, it shouldn't make you feel like I haven't. That the love isn't there for them. It's weird. It doesn't I'm, make I'm, sense. I understand that. You, you have to. I. I. I, I told As pressure mounts, Watts asks investigators if he can speak to his father, who is waiting in the police department. He wants to leave the interview room and investigators know by doing this, Watts could leave and get a lawyer in. They tactfully suggest Ronnie comes in the room to avoid the melee of people outside. As Ronnie enters, Watts finally confesses. This is the moment investigators have been waiting for, Watts finally confesses to murdering Shannon but adds a twist. He is claiming Shannon murdered the children, then in an act of rage he strangled her and disposed of their bodies. Recall back earlier in the interview, where Agent Lee discussed a case in which a mother had murdered her children, it appears Watts has used this to his defense. Chris, did Shannon do something to them? No, I don't know. I'm serious. I have no clue. No, you would have known, because they didn't leave the house. Like did Shanann do something to them, and then did you feel like you had to do something to Shanann? No. No, the, the, they were at the house when I left. They were there. They weren't there. They didn't leave. They vanished. If he can prove he acted in response to Shanann's actions, he could save himself from life in prison. This shows he is compass mentis and means they are dealing with a complex individual. Can I talk to my dad or something? Absolutely. Come. Do you want to bring him in here? No, uh, I just can't talk to my dad. I flew across the country. Hey, Greg, I can't. How about this? If we brought your dad in here, would you please tell him what happened? Can I just go talk to him? I've been in here for like five or six hours and I'm like... Absolutely. Chris, look at me, man. It's not going to feel any better. He deserves an answer. He's your best friend. There's only one person you wanted here most, and that's your dad. Chris. What would you tell him? Uh, I, I love him, and I don't... I just, I just want him to be by my side. Okay. He knows more than we do that you're a good man. And he knows as much as you want to protect you, um, your wife, Shannon. I think he would tell you to do the right thing. Before we get him, can I go out there and talk to him? Well, I don't know that you want to do it out there because there's a lot of people going through the halls. Should we bring him in here? We'll step out. Okay. Do you need a few minutes with him? Okay. Okay. Can we just ask a couple more questions? Hey, Chris, we're going to let you have uh, however much time you need, okay? Okay. Can we have us in there? No. Uh, yeah. Yes.
motions. It's so I mean they're not gonna let me go. Is there any reason why they shouldn't? No, they they know I had a fair. And they they know. I can't think about that.
This is not a case of he just snapped and reacted. Ronnie does his best to deal with the information, he even suggests that Shannon was mentally unstable. He and his son both share muted emotional responses. Watts begins to recount that fateful night, Shannon came home, they argued, she strangled the kids whilst he was packing up a lunch downstairs, he strangles her and doesn't bother to initiate any form of CPR or call emergency services. No one can predict reactions in situations like this but experienced investigators have enough insight to know, the facts and his testimony don't add up. Watts then details how he dragged Shannon's body across the dirt and buried her, then forced the bodies of Bella and Celeste through hatches with a diameter of 8 inches. Placing each body in separate oil tanks. A bed sheet matching the one found on the bed is found on the survey site. Watts tells investigators that the children's blankets and toys were left there but they are never found. Watts is now charged with the murder of Shannon, the information is leaked to the press and sadly for the Rukuzek family, they have to find out through the news media that their family is dead. Investigators have the heinous task of recovering the bodies. Watts has identified the locations of each body but the oil tanks contain hazardous chemicals and must be drained before retrieval can begin. Shannon's body is found in a shallow grave, she is wearing a t-shirt and underwear. Her body is in a fetal-like position, face down. Her fetus has separated from her body, decomposition rates accelerate due to heat. The girls' bodies are severely destroyed by the oil mixture, they are both found still wearing their bed clothing. The autopsy results reveal Shannon has bruising around her neck and jaw, these are consistent with strangulation. There were no other marks or bruises on her body. Both the girls had been smothered, sadly, Bella's tongue and frenulum were damaged, these injuries indicate Bella was conscious and fought for her life. Both their bodies had grazes from being forced into the tank. As Watts is processed, they take photographs of his face, hands, and torso. No wounds are present on his body. Shannon stood at 5 foot 7, Watts at 5 foot 11. Shannon's father is the first to point out that Shannon would have fought for her life. Both families begin to grieve and Watts is remanded into prison. Investigators need to establish the facts to corroborate Watts' account. As Shannon and the girls were found in bed clothing, this matches Watts' account for times. The stripped bedding and the girls' unmade beds matches Watts' account of events. Police officers are sent in to reenact the scenario that Shannon may have strangled the children. The post-mortems confirm Shannon was strangled but the children were smothered not strangled as Watts recounted. At this point, his entire defense rests upon Shannon's DNA being found on the girl's neck areas. Bella suffered bites to her tongue and a torn frenulum, this shows she was conscious during the event. The footage of Watts loading the truck is not clear enough to determine what he was loading, he angles the truck in a manner that obscures the camera view. The girls' blankets are not found, these blankets were always with the children, especially Celeste's. The call logs hours after the murders, Watts called the school to cancel the girls' places, he rang the realtor to put his house up for sale, he brazenly talks to police officers. He continues to maintain contact with Kessinger, playing down the fact his wife and children are missing. The day of the murder, he took the girls to a birthday party, after returning home, Frankie FaceTimed with Bella and Celeste around 5.30 p.m. 
At around 6 p.m. neighbors notice Watts barbecuing on his own on the back porch. The children were not seen after this point. He spent two hours chatting to Kessinger whilst waiting for Shannon to return home. Message exchanges between him and Shannon that day had been friendly. Investigators need to speak to Kessinger. The information she has could be vital in providing a motive for Watts. They already know by cell records that Watts and Kessinger had been in contact right up until the day before his arrest. Watts' employer also provided evidence with work emails between the two. Kessinger's first interview is informal, they just want to gather a baseline of their relationship. Kessinger confirms they met at the offices of Watts' work, that conversations began then gradually developed into a sexual relationship. The dates coincide with Shannon and the girls leaving for North Carolina. According to Kessinger, Watts had told her his marriage had ended and he was in the process of separation. She claims the relationship accelerated quickly. After meeting in June, he invited her over to his home in the beginning of July. She describes him as an introverted person but felt comfortable around her and they shared a passion for fitness and cars. Investigators ask Kessinger if they can access her phone records, she is apprehensive about this, claiming first that she had deleted everything when she found out days earlier that Shannon was pregnant and she was fearful of the adult content her and Watts had shared. She eventually complies to allow police to search her phone. Kessinger's statements and the phone evidence show some discourse. She claims that she did not know that Watts was still married but she frequently searched for Shannon's Facebook account. She claims she was invested in the relationship to an extent but searches had shown her looking for wedding dresses. A little damning is the fact she went to the Watts home on several occasions but never questioned the photos and mementos of Shannon and Chris in the home. Kessinger seems to lack the understanding of the seriousness of the situation, she repeatedly references concern for herself and her identity but only once seems to feign tears for the crime. He said that she was like pretty receptive to just not trying. He was like, she seemed like she just wants me to go. He's like, when she has her mind made up, she has her mind made up and that's what she wants. And he's like, she doesn't want to try anymore. And he's like, and neither do I really. And he was like, it's done. And he's like, um, and then the next day, I don't even know what days these were. Sometime when he was out there, he told me, um, we're putting the house up for sale as soon as we get back. And I was like, well, that was quick. And he was like, it's her, she's ready to go. And I was like, okay. And so I left it at that. And then, um, he got back and I started asking him, like, what are you going to do? Because the Colorado housing market is fire and you guys are going to sell this house, like, real fast. And I'm like, you need to start looking for a new place to live. And I'm like, where do you want to live? And I was really trying to help him out. I'm like, do you want to get a house? Do you want three bedrooms so you have one and each of your girls have one? I'm like, do you want to you know, like do an apartment, like what do you want? You know, where do you want to live? Because he's in Frederick, but that whole area over there is just like a bunch of small towns and you can kind of just pick and choose. Everything's kind of, you know, and so um, he told me why well, I, I like Brighton and I was like, okay. And then he told me he wanted a two bedroom apartment and he said he wanted one room for him and the other room for his two girls. And I thought it was kind of cute. Like, I remember telling him, I was like, yeah, me and my sister had bunk beds, like, at my dad's house. And I was like, when we were little girls, and we were, me and my sister were the same age apart as him and his, I mean, as his two daughters, you know. So I told him, I was like, they're going to love it. I was like, they might be, like, stuck in, in one room together. I was like, but they'll become, like, best buddies. No, I don't even know how long he was out there. I know it was, like, less than two weeks and more than one. Okay. I don't remember. So he, was, he comes back early August, would that be fair? Oh yeah, it was definitely like in the first two weeks somewhere. All right. Probably the second week of August at some point in that, I don't remember when. Does his wife come back with him at that time? Or yeah, they he... all came back. They all come back at the same they time? They all came back. Um, and then uh, 
yeah, so he he continues to just you know tell me that this is like what he wants and and so I took the time and you will see that in the text too where I like like there like I found this apartment it was perfect I really try to take everything with this whole situation very slow the only part that I screwed up on was the fact that he wasn't completely separated from her when him and I decided to spend time with each other that is where I screwed up but other than that everything else it was always like you know you build your life, I'm going to build my life, we will intertwine them, but I am not ready to, like, do this. And he respected that. And I and I, um, I even said that, and I don't know, I, that might be in the text, but so said that two words, like, Chris, like, you need space. Like, you're just getting out of a divorce. Like, personally, I think jumping into a new relationship is a little quick. It's like, I was in a relationship earlier this year, and I think this is also a little quick. And I'm like, so why don't we take our time? And I'm like, if you guys end up doing a week on, a week off with your kids, I'm like, the week you have your kids, be with your children. And the week that you don't, I'm like, I don't even want to see you every day. I'm like, I think we should spend like a few days of that together. I'm like, cause I like my space and I think you need your space. I think you need your space to like develop your identity again and like get it back because I think he's just been like so wrapped up in this whole thing that he's got in his own life and his life that he, I mean, he doesn't remember probably what it's like to like be single or have time where it's like just him. Sure. And so her behavior almost casts suspicion towards her involvement with Watts. Was she toying with his emotions, leading him on then pushing him away? Kessinger is very vague when recalling what was discussed the night of Shan Ann's murder. Most people in that situation would reflect and analyze every detail of the past conversation looking for a hint or clue. She recalls the meal they had the day prior, and tells officers Watts seemed uninterested, distant. She also recalls how she was supporting Watts with searching for an apartment for himself and the girls. In fact, she knew detailed information about Bella and Celeste yet told her friend she wasn't really interested in dating a guy who has a family. Kessinger tells investigators that she has a male friend staying with her, she refuses to disclose his details and is adamant he has nothing to do with the situation. Could this have triggered Watts, did he see this guy as a threat to his happiness? Kessinger recalls a time earlier in the relationship when she told Watts she had some dates lined up, he was devastated by this. He was unable to perform sexual relations with Kessinger, he was deeply affected by her actions, yet he was conflicted as he was doing the same to Shannon. It's apparent that Kessinger had some sort of effect on Watts, he was clearly besotted with her, caught up in this newfound liberation that she provided him. But there is a feeling that there was more to the relationship than Kessinger is willing to disclose. She searched the net worth of the mistress involved in the high-profile Scott Peterson case, was she already planning to profit from the murders? Her work contract was terminated, aside from an interview with the Denver Post, Kessinger has opted to keep a low profile. As Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and baby Nico are laid to rest, prosecutors continue to build a case against Watts. His sketchy confession means autopsy records are sealed until a trial date is set. He seems to adapt to prison life he is segregated and given a Bible to read. He complies with prison officers and attends frequent meetings with lawyers. Fan mail begins to amass, it seems uncomprehensible that women would lust after such a person and questions the type of person who would want to befriend him. The case is gaining high media interest. The public are shocked how a seemingly successful, 
attractive suburban family could end in such horror. As lawyers wade through the evidence, it's becoming clear there was no way Shannon could have predicted what was coming. What they do need to determine though, did Watts snap as he claimed or was this pre-planned? Evidence shows that Shannon offered Watts an opportunity to leave. To proceed with separation. He plays a game of push and pull with Shannon, saying he wants to leave then changing his mind. He told Kessinger he wanted his own place but then tells Shannon he wants them to move to nearby Brighton. Shannon gifts Watts a marriage self-help book which he chucks in the trash. He tells both women that his children are his world, what is truth and lies is becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish. The impending trial is a daunting thought for the families and the possibility of a death sentence in the state of Colorado loomed for Watts. Prosecutors then discussed a plea deal with Watts, in return for a confession he could waiver the death penalty and avoid going to trial and serve life in prison. The Rzusks, being of Catholic faith felt the death sentence was a burden they could not bear and agreed with the plea deal. Watts confessed, and after a heartbreaking sentencing hearing was given life in prison. But God only knows what happened that night. Life will never be the same without Shannon, Ballard, and Celeste and Nico. Had all their lives to live, they were taken by a heartless one. This is the heartless one, the evil monster, who dare you take the lives of my daughter Shannon, Bella, Celeste, and Nico. I trusted you to take care of them, not kill them. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't cry for my family. They were my whole world. All I do is ask myself why. Why would you do this? You don't deserve to be called a man. What kind of person slaughters the people that love them the most? Did you really think you would get away with this? Did you really think that this was your best option, to throw away your family like they were garbage? I want the world to know that our daughter and her children were so loved by us. There will always be protected by God and his mighty angels. As your mother, Chris, I have always loved you, and I still do. I hate what has happened. Your father and sister and I are struggling to understand why. But we will remain faithful as your family, just as God remains faithful because of his unconditional love for all, for us all. We love you, and we forgive you, son. Over the weekend leading up to August 13th, she had been at a work conference in Phoenix, Arizona, and re uh, returned home in the early morning hours of August 13th. We know that she got home about 1.45 in the morning. The doorbell camera on their home shows her arriving back home uh, from the airport. Shortly thereafter, at least according to the defendant, they had a, what he referred to as an emotional conversation about the state of their marriage and about what their lives would look like going forward. What was said during that emotional conversation, only he knows. What we do know is that shortly after that, the defendant strangled her to death with his own hands. We know that he slowly took her life the morning of August 13th. We know that this was not done in an uncontrolled, vengeful manner that he tried to describe to agents from CBI and the FBI. If that were the case, you would expect to see vicious, horrible bruising about her neck, shoulders, and face. You would expect to see the hyoid bone in her neck broken. You would expect to see some kind of defensive wounds on his body as she struggled and fought for her own life. None of those are present. The only injuries that were on Shanann's body were one set of finger uh, or bruising, what appeared to be fingernail or finger mark bruising to the right side of her neck. We know that our experts will tell us that it takes two to four minutes to strangle someone to death manually with their own hands. The horror that she felt as the man that she loved wrapped his hands around her throat and choked the life out of her must have been unimaginable. Even worse, what must Bella, age four, and Celeste, age three, 
must have experienced or thought is their father, the one man on this planet who was supposed to nurture and protect them, was snuffing out their lives. They both died from smothering. Let me say that again. The man seated to my right smothered his daughters. Why? Imagine the horror in Bella's mind as her father took her last, last breaths away. Your Honor, understand very clearly, Bella fought back for her life. The frenulum, the connective tissue between her upper lip and her gum had an inch and a half, excuse me, a centimeter and a half laceration. She bit her tongue multiple times before she died. She fought back for her life as her father smothered her. Celeste had no such injuries. In fact, she had no external injuries at all. But according to the medical examiner, she was smothered nonetheless. He then drove them away from their family home one final time, intent on hiding any evidence of the crimes that he had just committed. In one final sign of callousness for his wife, his daughters, and their unborn son, and their remains, he drove them to a location that he thought no one would ever find them, to one of the oil tank batteries with which he was so familiar. He knew this was safe. He had texted a co-worker the night before saying, I'll head out to that site. I'll take care of it. He had carefully ensured that he would be alone in the middle of the plains to secrete away the remains of his family in a place that he hoped they would never be found. In one final measure of disrespect for the family he once had, he ensured that they would not be together even in death, or he, so he thought. He disposed of them in different locations. He buried Shanann and Nico in a shallow grave away from the oil tanks. Bella and Celeste were thrown away in the oil tanks at this facility. Different tanks so these little girls wouldn't be together in death. Imagine this, Your Honor. This defendant took those little girls and put them through a hatch at the top of an oil tank eight inches in diameter. Bella had scratches on her left buttocks from being shoved through this hole. A tuft of blonde hair was found on the edge of one of these hatches. The defendant told investigators that Bella's tank seemed emptier than CC's because of the sound that the splashes made. These were his daughters. Significantly, when his co-workers arrived at the tank battery later that morning, to a person, they all described him as acting completely normally. It was a normal work day. Even while his daughter sank in the oil and water not far away from him. And then his efforts at deception truly began. We've all seen the emotionless interviews that the defendant gives to the local media asking for help in locating his family. We watched as he claimed that the house was empty without them and that he hoped that they were somewhere safe and that he just wanted them to come home. He told investigators that they were at home sleeping when he left for work that morning and that Shanann had told him that he was, she was taking the girls to a friend's house for the day. What is striking about this case, Your Honor, beyond the horrors that I've already described to you, is the number of collateral victims that he created by his actions. While he stood in front of TV cameras asking for the safe return of his family, scores of law enforcement officers, neighbors, friends and family scoured the area. Why did Nico, Celeste, Bella and Shanann have to lose their lives in order for him to get what he wanted? Your Honor, justice demands the maximum sentence under the agreement reached by the parties. As you will recall, the agreement calls for life sentences as to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste, and all of those to run consecutively to one another. It also calls for the count of unlawful termination of a pregnancy as to Nico to run consecutively to counts one, two, and three. I would suggest that the extreme aggravation present in the defendant's conduct and in his, uh, the efforts that I have described mandate that the sentences for counts seven, eight, and nine, the tampering with the deceased human body, each be the maximum of 12 years 
and that those sentences run consecutively to one another. It is very clear that each of these acts, excuse me, that these were not the subject of one act, but each oil tank that he walked up with his daughter's bodies and the hole that he dug for his wife and unborn son mandate a mandatory consecutive sentence. At the point where families should be allowed to pick up the pieces, grieve and try to move forward in life, Watts has spoken with investigators on February 18th and provided a new account of the events that occurred that night. Something Shannon's family have had to bear is living with the fact that Watts ultimately branded Shannon as the murderer, even though evidence proved to the contrary. This confession has intended to free Shannon from blame. The following is Watts describing the events of that day in his own words. So, nothing really happened that night, it was in the morning, okay. it was, you know, me and Shannon, she got home like at 2 o'clock, and, uh, you know, I felt her get into bed, and I just thought like I didn't really, didn't, didn't feel like I just wanted to make sure, I looked at my phone like I was 2 o'clock to make sure she was okay, she was in there, and I could kind of feel her kind of stirring around a little bit, and, uh, she, I, I just had a feeling that she knew like what was going on. Cause I mean, obviously, I didn't use like a, a an NRO gift card, you know, that I'd gotten. I'd use my actual credit card, and I, I kind of just felt like something. She knew what was going on, and she, uh, she started rubbing her hand on me, and we ended up having sex. But uh, uh, I guess that was more like a test. Oh, I, I would have thought. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because when we talked, uh, when I woke up like, or later on in the morning, like, you know, I I pretty much, you know, told her, like, you know, I didn't think it was going to work anymore. And she was like, what happened? What was last night? You know, mm -hmm. so I figured that that's what we call the test after I've gone through everything in my head. That makes sense. And she just told me, you know, like, to get off of her. And she was like, I knew, some, I knew there was somebody else. I knew there was somebody else. I knew there was somebody else. And I couldn't bring it up. I couldn't just say, yes, there is somebody else. But then she said, you're never going to see the kids again. You're never going to see them again. Get off me. Don't hurt me. And then, is that what she said? Because like when I climbed in bed, that was pretty much like on top, pretty much like straddling her kind of doing. Okay. And she thought I was gonna like, you know, hurt her or her baby or something. So, cause, she, cause she knew that like, you know, I, something had happened. She thought I was just trying to, you know, just check out or something. So, okay. And then that's when that happened. So then, Shanann, did she actually say you're never gonna see the kids again? She said that to me before. Yeah. That's kind of hard to hear. Yeah, because she'd said to me before she went to Arizona. Because, like, I wasn't really sleeping in the bedroom. I was sleeping on the couch or in the basement bed or something. And, like, she had slammed the door. You're never going to see the kids again. It's almost like we knew, like, something was combating at, at, at each other. And we didn't know, like, it, was, it wasn't ourselves. Really? No. Anger from you or anger from her? I think it was more anger from me and more, like, desperation from her to... That conversation went so many different ways. Like they had gone from like staying together to not staying together to just like all of the above. Okay. So this is half an hour, an hour, or what? Uh, uh, definitely not more than half an hour. I don't think. Okay. I don't think. Are you crying? Is she crying? Yeah, it's, it's back and forth. It's like you know she's she's got you know mascara. She didn't wash her face when she got home. She had makeup on still, so her mascara is running all over her and stuff like that. And, yeah, it was and nothing, nothing about that conference. I just wish I could take all of it back, just to be, just to the whole Nikki thing back, everything. But straddling her was kind of like around her waist type deal. Why did you get on her like that? I just when we got off, when we got on the bed, that's that's just where I got on. Is that so she would listen to you? I felt like I mean, she could probably listen to me just laying beside her, but I got on top of her. And every time I think about it, I'm just like, did I know I was going to do that before I got on top of her? I don't know. Really? That's an interesting thought, Chris. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you knew. 
just like the whole everything that happened that morning. I just don't, I don't know. Like, I, I try to go back in my head. I'm just like, I didn't want to do this, but I did it. And just, everything just kind of like felt like you had to. It just felt like it was. I, I don't even want to say it. it. Felt like I had to. It just felt like there was already something in my mind that was implanted that I was going to do it. And then I woke up that morning, it was going to happen, and I had no control of it. Feeling like it was in motion and you just couldn't stop it. Yeah, it was just like. I don't even want to know what, what she saw when she looked back at me, honestly. Did you look at her? What was she doing? She was fighting. Why do you think she wasn't fighting? I don't know. It's, uh, maybe she was praying. Maybe she was just... Now I read, read the Bible and said, you know, like, you know, uh, heard the scripture that says, don't, uh, uh, forgive these people for they do not know what they do. Mm -hmm. um, maybe she was saying that. I don't know what she was saying in her head, but she, you know. Just, um, uh, just a after, you know, shenanigans, I guess, once, it, once I was, once, once she was gone, it was just like, I, I didn't, didn't know what what was going on. It's like it was like a traumatic, I don't know what you call it, a traumatic event type, and everything. And like I was shaking. I didn't know what had happened. I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I had done. I still wasn't in that right state of mind. I don't think like like I was in control of what I could think or what I could do at that point in time. Like most people say, like, why don't you just call 911? Why don't you, like, unless you're in that situation, you know, you, you don't, don't know. You don't know what you would have done. Mm -hmm. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Is that what happened? Bella came in. What she said. Oh, my. Did she hear something? Is that what she came Obviously, in? I think. Okay. What'd you tell me? that happened with Bella right in that room? Not in front of her. What happened? She just, she walked in as, you know, she talking about she was, she was sleeping. Mm -hmm. Did you take her back to her room? Put Shannon in that sheet and you found the site. Okay. And what? carried her downstairs and backed my truck up. At that point, were the girls still there? Okay. So then she nans in the truck, then went back to the house. Got okay, everybody back in the truck. Was Bella first or was Cece first? In the truck. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So she was first, and then Bella was next. Was Bella alive when you put it when you guys got in the truck? Oh, okay. What happened? Go back up. Okay. This, 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 I don't really want to talk just about this part. Honestly. Okay. Those are my kids. Just my baby. I have to talk to them every night. I don't help to see them. Every time I see pictures of them, I don't know how this could have happened. You know, being a dad was the best part of my life. I took it all away. I think that is the hardest part for us, Chris, is we see those videos, we see that love that you had for your girls. Like, it's obvious to us, and even to us, we it's hard for us to understand how a dad who's giving piggyback rides and, you know, making snacks and watching princess movies and those kinds of things. Um, how you get to that point, you know? I don't know. Just, like I said, it was just like something else was controlling me that day. I had no control over what I was, like, to fight back. Yeah. 
like when that prosecutor said it felt a bitter tongue, like repeatedly I just, I just wanted to just bang my head up against the wall. So you put Shinan in the truck and then you put the two girls in the truck? Were they just sitting in their car seats or, or I guess they didn't probably have car no, seats they, in your no, truck, did no, they? No, they were sitting in the back with the, like in that, that bench. And so Shinan was back there too? She was so on the floor. What did they say about Shinan being on the floor? Mommy okay? What did you tell them? She'll, she'll be fine. Did you have your their stuff with them, with their toys and their blankets and stuff? They had they had some they had something with them that they carried. One of them, I think, at CC and Bella had like a blanket or something with them, mm -hmm. like a pink, a pink blanket. Or... What about the dog? I think one of them had a dog, right? That talked or dog. Yeah, they had, yeah. One of them had like a little barking dog. Was that with you too? Do you know? I think it was. Try to, try to, it's hard to remember. Like yeah. if they had like the big blanket, small blanket. So, I think I saw um, on the video that you put a gas can or something in the back of your truck. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Did you have different plans no, when just, you put that in there? I don't know what was going through my head. I feel like I maybe I could just get rid of myself at the same time if I was doing all this. Yeah. Did you just think about that? What did you think about that? I felt like I deserved to live after what happened. So what made you not do that? Do you think? I don't know if it was just more of like a... Because with the, with the site, maybe it was just more of like... I would have hurt more people than just me and everybody else. But I know there's other people out there. Not like at the site, but other people like maybe out in the area. Like I didn't want something like on the site to catch fire and blow up. So did you stri drive straight out there? So what were you thinking on the way out there? I was kind of like what I'm doing right now. I'm just like, you know, Nervous, shaking, not knowing, like, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah. CC was first. She did have a blanket. She had a blue blanket. A Yankee blanket. So was she alive when she went into the oil tank? No? I put the blanket over her head. And that's how she passed. Good grief. No. I put the blanket over her head. I didn't want to... No. I strangled her right there in the back seat. Okay. What was Bella doing? She was sitting right beside her. Did she understand? Did she know what was going on? She didn't say anything. And then the same for Bella? Just without a blanket? With the blanket. Oh, okay. I didn't look. I think every time I in my eyes, I started to hear her say, Daddy, no, and that was it. That's what Bella said. I hear that every day. Do you really? Is it possible that in your mind you didn't want them to suffer throughout their life? Was this like a mercy thing? I mean, you can say that like after the fact, but it was just like, I don't... You didn't feel like that during I, that? I just didn't. I felt like it was just like an anger with Shanann, with everything that I was just taking it out on everybody that was in front of me that morning. Yeah. Like, this was like the epitome of being angry. Yeah. 
the epitome of like showing a rage, the epitome of like losing, losing your mind. Shannon and Watts had a healthy relationship up until Watts met Kessinger and began his affair. Shannon worked hard for her family. She had set goals and wanted the best for her children. Some have speculated that she was controlling and dominant towards Watts but Shannon was just a determined woman and cared for those around her, including Watts. She promoted her business and had excelled up the career ladder building a network of friends on the way. She was raised in a loving, supportive family who frequently cared for their grandchildren so Shannon and Watts could enjoy the perks of trips provided by Shannon's company. Watts was a good father and husband but being introverted meant he lacked the ability to show emotional response properly. Leading up to the murders, he loses over a stone in a matter of weeks attributing this partly to using two burn patches that he claims raised his heart rate excessively. Being with Kessinger began to trigger an emotional roller coaster for his brain. The high he gained from cheating, combined with the physical attraction and the lack of responsibility he had from not being around his family would have felt empowering to him. He was the kid in the candy shop. But Shannon became the pull back to reality, the reminder that he has a family to care for. The daunting fact that a baby is coming. He is faced with a life he wants and the dilemma of the life he has already created. He is conflicted and emotionally losing control. Despite his confession, there are still missing links, Watts has had extensive time to contemplate his crime and his story. He even said he had thought of killing himself, trying to fit the profile of the family annihilator. Despite his confession, it is important not to lose sight of the fact he lied to everyone around him after the event, it was his hands that ended four lives that day and his decision to do so. Bella and Celeste never stood a chance against him and claiming Shannon's natural survival instincts did not kick in and instead she was praying seems pure fantasy, Watts has a complex psychology, he claims to have an amazing imagination but every lie he told was based upon incident and prompts. He claims he's able to suppress his emotions but then why did this fail on the night Shannon returned home? There is enough circumstantial evidence to suggest Watts was planning this before Shannon even got home. He claims that he and Shannon had a long talk before he murdered her, after they'd had sex and slept for a little while. Remember Watts is claiming Shannon was suspicious of his fidelity, she tells friends he has rejected her sexual advances, having sex seems the last thing they'd want to do considering Watts had sex with Kessinger the night before. Listening to all Watts' accounts, it was more probable that he waited until Shannon was asleep before getting on top of her and strangling her. It's doubtful they even spoke, yet alone argued that night. Shannon and her children became the victims of a toxic love affair. Kessinger knew all along Watts was still married and she was his mistress. Did she push Watts over the edge? No one will ever know, except for Watts. It's time to let Shannon, Bella, Celeste and Nico rest in peace and leave Watts to spend the rest of life haunted by what he took away from the world.